I want to thank Dr. McClister and the Bible Department for the opportunity to speak today. I'm really excited to be here and to have this opportunity. And one reason is I have a lot of family here. Uh, my mom's family, they're here. My grandparents are here. And then didn't realize, but uh, coming to the trip, that my dad's sisters are both here. And so just a blessing to have this family reunion. God has been so good to me. There's no way I'll ever be able to fully appreciate the blessing of being surrounded by family, aunts and uncles and grandparents who are Christians and encouraging uh, me with my walk with Christ. But I say thank you to him. What was Jesus' first miracle? A few hundred years after the gospel, stories circulated among heretical groups of Jesus doing miracles as a child. For example, the infancy gospel of Thomas, supposedly by a guy named Thomas the Israelite, he says it all started this way. So this is the beginning. When Jesus was five years old, he's by the river and he's instantly making water pure and he's taking clay and forming it into sparrows, but someone told on him because it was the Sabbath day. And so his dad comes running along and says, what are you doing? And he claps his hands and the birds fly off. And the stories from there really just get more absurd. But that highlights this thought, what was the first miracle? And wouldn't there be a lot of significance and purpose behind whatever it was that Jesus chose to do First, my text this morning is from John chapter 2, and it is a brief but very well-known passage, uh, even to people who are not very religious. Everybody knows that Jesus turned water to wine. But could it be that many have missed the main point of that story? And so that's our task this morning, to explore this passage See, what is the significance? Why is this the first sign? I trust that this audience is familiar with the story. But let's go ahead and read it together so that the details are fresh in our minds. John chapter 2, beginning in verse 1, I'm reading from the New American Standard Version. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there, and both Jesus and his disciples were invited to the wedding. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does that have to do with us? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, whatever he says to you, do it. Now there were six stone water pots set there for the Jewish custom of purification containing 20 or 30 gallons each. Jesus said to them, fill the water pots with water. So they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, draw some out now and take it to the head waiter. So they took it to him. When the head waiter tasted the water which had become wine and did not know where it came from, but the servants who had drawn the water knew, the head waiter called the bridegroom and said to him, every man serves the good wine first, and when people have drunk freely, then he serves the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This beginning of his signs Jesus did in Cana of Galilee and manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Most of us study and teach the Bible in the context of teaching 45-minute classes. And so we're constrained to really just look at, at a story and maybe other than the very obvious connections, we don't have time to dig into all the connections that might be there. And so then we might not really look at the surrounding context. We, we treat each story as a distinct story. But notice that the opening words of this passage are on the third day. John demands that his readers connect this story with what went before it. Even as his disciples at that wedding, they wouldn't have said, oh, we've just found the Messiah. That was three days ago. You know, who do you think is going to win the Super Bowl next year? Surely they were still talking about what had just happened 
that previous week. And so John wants us to think about that as we look at this story. There's two things that I want to highlight. All the Gospels mention John the Baptist, but only in John's Gospel do we find this proclamation that Jesus is the Lamb of God. And in fact, on two occasions, once to the crowds at large, John chapter 1 and verse 29, and then privately to two of the disciples, this is the Lamb of God. Of course, John's readers, his first audience, we know the significance of that. We know that Jesus' ministry will result in his sacrificial death. But the disciples didn't know that. And, and were they so caught up in this possibility, we found the Messiah, that they didn't stop to consider, what does this mean? This is God's lamb. Well, throughout his gospel, John will use this technique, exploit the difference between what his readers know and what the characters inside the story don't know to create irony, to heighten tension, or to point to some deeper meaning. And I think that's the case here. Then secondly, we have the interaction with Nathaniel. You remember, Jesus meets Nathaniel, and before Jesus meets Nathaniel, he's told, oh, we found the Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. Can anything good come out of Nazareth? But then he meets Jesus, and he's surprised at Jesus' supernatural knowledge. Here's an Israelite without any guile. How did you know? you? Oh, I saw you sitting beneath the tree. And he just immediately confesses, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. You may have noticed the breakdown of the lectures that today it is Christ as king. And maybe you've never thought of the story of the water to wine in connection with the kingship of Jesus. But one aspect is that it is this interaction with Nathaniel that leads into this story where the confession is, you are the son of God, the king of Israel. Jesus is amazed that Nathaniel would so quickly confess his identity. You believe this fast? You're going to see greater things than this. And ultimately, that points to his resurrection. But it is no coincidence that the path to understanding the identity of Jesus begins in Nathaniel's hometown of Cana with this miracle of turning the water to wine. Well, as we proceed with the text... There are many other connections that we find in this story with the rest of John's gospel. For example, the only appearance of Jesus' mother is in this scene and then at the crucifixion. In both scenes, Jesus calls her woman, something that would have grabbed the attention of the first readers, even as it does us today. In our scene in Cana, Jesus turns water into wine. At the cross, after acknowledging his mother, he is offered sour wine in response to his thirst. In this scene, he distances himself from his mother, whereas at the cross, he compassionately tends to her needs. Jesus' response to Mary, the, the question, what is this to us, is an idiomatic phrase, and it can be harsh or rude. It isn't necessarily so, but it, it can be. But it, at least it, it creates distance. And so here we have this setting, probably a family wedding, relatives of Jesus and Mary, in which Jesus is emphasizing, my life no longer centers upon the normal cares of this world. I'm here to fulfill the task given to me by my heavenly Father. John calls this the beginning or first of Jesus' signs. And in so doing, he creates the structure, the first half of his book. And I think this audience is aware of this. John chapter 2 through 11 is the book of signs. He selects, out of all the miracles Jesus did, he selects seven signs to fulfill this purpose, to show the identity of Jesus so that we can believe that he is the Son of God and have life in his name. This first half of the book divides into two sections, the first of which is the Cana cycle. And so the first miracle happens at Cana. Chapter 4, towards the end, the emphasis is made that Jesus is in Cana, but he does that long-distance miracle. The miracle occurs in Capernaum. And so that shows the section that we're in. And all of this shows the guidance of the Holy Spirit, not just when John sat down to write, but through 40, 50 years of preaching. John is telling these stories 
And God, and not just in the stories that he chooses, but the way that they're told to produce this maximum effect. And so as we read John's carefully composed narrative, we find numerous connections between these stories, and especially in the signs. And we'll just highlight the first and the final signs as they correspond strongly. The first occurs at a wedding, of course, the scene of rejoicing. The seventh sign at a funeral. Both signs are in reaction to women close to Jesus, his mother, and then Martha and Mary. In both cases, they believe in Jesus, but they're not quite sure what he's going to do. And initially, there seems to be a a delay, which might be a rejection or an ignoring of the request. But then Jesus goes on to fulfill the request. While most at the wedding are not aware of what Jesus has done, at least initially, we don't know how word spread, the raising of Lazarus rocks Jerusalem, even to the point that the leaders are willing to kill Lazarus in addition to Jesus. John concludes that this miracle, even though it was largely unseen, manifested Jesus' glory. The glory of the Father and the Son are central to the resurrection of Lazarus in John chapter 11. A resurrection miracle makes sense as the concluding sign. Why would Jesus turn water to wine at a wedding as his first sign? Well, the details that we've highlighted so far show the care with which this story is told, but they're really done in that way to draw our attention to highlight key concepts that are found in this story. And so we're going to highlight three this morning. The first is Jesus' hour. The narrative breaks into three scenes, and the first is with Jesus and his mother, the dialogue that takes place. The most significant phrase is the last one when Jesus says, my hour has not yet come. And the statement is abrupt. It grabs our attention. So now through the rest of John's gospel, We're on the lookout. We notice when there's a reference made to Jesus' hour. In John chapter 7, his brothers are saying, aren't you going up to the feast? And he says, my time has not yet come. Then later, when he does go to the feast, not publicly, there are those who want to lay their hands upon him, but we're told that they're not able to do so because his hour has not yet come. In John chapter 8, similarly, Despite the controversial things that he says, they're not able to arrest him because his hour has not yet come. Then we reach John chapter 12, the final week of Jesus' life. In John chapter 12 and verse 23, and also in John chapter 17 and verse 1, Jesus announces that his hour has come and he connects it with his glorification. Being glorified is the ultimate result achieved in his hour, but it can only come through the horrific suffering of the cross. So in John chapter 12 and verse 27, Jesus confesses his anxiety, but he states his resolve. Now my soul has become troubled. And what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this purpose, I came to this hour. These passages emphasize that Jesus' death is the focus of his hour, and it's the means to his glorification. The glorified son cannot be seen until the Lamb of God has been sacrificed. Since his hour focuses on his death, why would Mary's request annoy Jesus? Turning water to wine was probably pretty popular back then, just as the notion is today. There certainly weren't any death threats emanating from this event. Well, maybe another statement of Jesus about time gives us the clue. John chapter 11 and verse 9 where he says, Are there not 12 hours in the day? Time is limited. Mary comes to him and makes this request. This is kind of a side point. It's not in, in the book. I think what we'll see from this miracle is it almost seems like it was predestined to happen. I mean, this was planned from eternity, it seems like, and yet would it have happened if Mary wouldn't have asked for it? 
Jesus seems to say, don't you realize what you're asking? The time is not yet. Once the time starts, we can't go back. And I have to operate according to what the Father has told me to do. But then he does act. And does that give us some insight into the nature of God? He's planned things. There's things that are going to happen. The scheme of redemption is going to take place. And yet he listens to us. We can go to the Father through Christ and make our request. And so on this occasion, he listens to Mary. And yet at the same time, he indicates you're not aware of what's at stake, how this ministry will end. And so once he started, the clock began ticking. A second key concept that's related to this idea of his hour, as we've highlighted, is that Jesus manifested his glory. So we've already highlighted several of the passages that bring this up, and it's, it's connected to the idea of his hour. But let's mention a few other things. First, the wording. Jesus manifested his glory. This wasn't an accident. It wasn't incidental happening apart from his will with the authority given to him by the Father. Jesus chose the time and the place to manifest his glory. Secondly, his glory references his identity as the only begotten from the Father. John chapter 1 and verse 14, the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory. The glory is the only begotten from the Father. Jesus' words and his deeds, and this week we're focusing a lot on the deeds, but then each lecture I've attended connects it strongly to the message that is revealed in that. The words and his deeds bore witness to the reality of who he is, though it was hidden by the flesh. And so while he dwelt, literally tented or tabernacled among his disciples, his miracles displayed the same creative, sustaining power of Yahweh who guided the Israelites through the wilderness. And then finally, the revealing of his glory is the determining factor in belief. As John wrote it, he manifested his glory and his disciples believed in him. Verbs of seeing and knowing are very prominent in John's gospel. Even as we just quoted John chapter 1 and verse 14, that the disciples beheld his glory. They saw his glory. That's why they were disciples. In contrast to that, John gives the reason why many rejected Jesus. First, in Jesus' own words in John chapter 5 and verse 44, how can you believe when you receive glory from one another? And then in John chapter 12, in my opinion, a, um, in some ways an overlooked passage. There's so many great passages in John. How can you pick the, the best ones? And, of course, we look at the miracles and how important they are. And then we skip to the death and, and resurrection. But in John chapter 12, in a very significant passage, John once again goes back to why is it that people are not believing? And he quotes from Isaiah, a passage that's quoted in all the Gospels and other places, the idea that they have eyes but they can't see, they have ears and they can't hear. Then notice what he says is about, about Isaiah. Isaiah saw his glory and spoke of him. Isaiah saw the glory of Christ. And when you truly see the glory of Christ, you can't help but speak, but confess who Jesus is. But then right after that, there were people who believed in Jesus. They knew he was doing miracles, but they were afraid to confess. They didn't truly believe. They were afraid. They loved the approval of of men. And so that blinded them to the glory that was before them. The word that really shows us, encourages us to look for a deeper meaning in this event is that John calls this a sign. And he says it's the first, the beginning of signs. Whereas the synoptics prefer the word miracle, 
John uses signs and works. As the narrator, he uses the word signs. Jesus, when he's talking, he calls his miracles works. Miracle or dunamis emphasizes the breaking in of God's power to defeat Satan and establish his reign. Brother Malden did a great job in the previous lecture talking about the casting out of demons. Exorcisms are prominent in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. There are no exorcisms in John. John's use of signs is explained to us in the purpose statement, which you all know so well, John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. And it reminds us of God's action through Moses at the time of the Exodus. In Exodus chapter 4 and Exodus chapter 10, we're told that Moses did these signs in the sight of the people so that they would know that Moses was sent by God and that they would know that Yahweh, the Lord, is God. That was the purpose of those signs. Like Jesus' opponents, Pharaoh's heart was hardened when he rejected the signs. Exodus chapter 7, verses 8 through 22 clearly spells that out. Pharaoh knew miracles were happening but he rejected the meaning of the signs. And then just as Moses wrote God's saving deeds and commandments in a book so that the Israelites would have life, Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 10 through 16, John wrote Jesus' signs in a book so that believers may have eternal life. A sign is something that draws attention to itself, but then points to something greater. It points beyond it. I like the illustration of, of a hand. Uh, those of us who are, are parents, uh, fathers, you've all done this. Uh, give me the remote. And then your three-year-old says, where? It, it's over there. And they keep looking at your hand. It, it's over there. Then they look down at their feet. It's over there. And, and then finally, you, you, out of frustration, you, you say, it's over there, you special, special Precious child. <laughs> How often do you think God does that with us? <laughs> He's given us the signs. And we're supposed to not look at the hand. The hand gets our attention, but then we're supposed to follow that to whatever it's pointing to. And so faith is not recognizing that something's happened. You know, Jesus' enemies knew that a miracle took place. Faith is accepting the meaning, whatever it is that the sign has pointed to. That's true faith. And usually in John's gospel, these miracles, these signs, they spark a greater discussion. Whether it's a conversation or just Jesus talking. And it makes it clear what the point of the sign is. There's no mistaking the healing of the blind man in John 9 or the resurrection of Lazarus in John chapter 11. We know what those mean. But in this case, there is no discussion that follows. John quickly moves to the next story. And so he calls it a sign, but to what is it pointing? And that brings us back to our original question. Why is this the first miracle. I believe there's several layers of meaning in this event. The action, the element of wine, and the setting of the wedding contribute to our understanding. First of all, the action. The miracle is actually only described in a half sentence. It doesn't even get a full sentence. When the head waiter tasted the water that had become one. It's really the words of the head waiter that provoke our thought when he says, you, the bridegroom, saved this good wine until now. And the readers, we know that the good wine came through a miraculous intervention. And so the turning of water into good wine emphasizes two concepts, transformation and superiority. John indicated in the prologue that Jesus is superior to Moses. John chapter 1 and verse 17, that the law came through Moses, but Jesus revealed grace and truth. Moses brought the law. It was good. It fulfilled its purpose, but the time had run out. 
Jesus brings grace and truth. That is a true covenant relationship with the Father. The comparisons with Moses will continue in the Gospel of John. The reference to the six stone vessels for Jewish purification highlight Jesus' superiority over Jewish rituals of purification. But then even in the context, it highlights the comparison that's being made even with any purification ritual, including John the Baptist's baptism that was sent by God. Because in these chapters, we find Jesus surpassing John as well. The themes of transformation and superiority continue in the succeeding stories. To the shock of Jewish authorities, Jesus proclaimed he could rebuild a destroyed temple in three days. Theirs took 46 years to construct, and they were still working on it. To Nicodemus, he offered a new birth, one far superior to physical birth from privileged ancestry. To the Samaritan woman, he offered water far greater than that found by the Jewish patriarch Jacob. He promised new worship that transcended physical places and ethnic identities. Jesus is the true bread that comes down out of heaven. He is the light of the world. To prove that he was transformative and superior, there's a lot of miracles Jesus could have done. But he turned water into wine. This adds another layer of meaning that draws us to the thought of the messianic banquet. The wedding account is so brief that we may initially doubt that John expected his audience to read so much into this episode. I hope you were here for Rusty Taylor's talk yesterday. If you were, then that expectation has been met. You know he expected us to see a lot in that, in these stories. But just to give some more evidence, first of all, when it comes to wine, John's first readers lived in ancient cultures, we say the Greco-Mediterranean world, in which wine was widely viewed as a gift from the gods, or for the Jewish people, a gift from God. They regularly pictured wine in religious context, which is evidenced by many archaeological remains. But then beyond that kind of general concept, John expected his readers to know the Old Testament or to have some teachers in each congregation that knew the Old Testament really well and could guide the congregation in this. And you don't have to search long to find references to wine connected to blessing and the Messianic era. So let's take a little bit of time and look at some of these. The broader concept is that the abundance of wine is the sign of a good harvest, which is a blessing from God, and the lack of wine indicates punishment. So in Deuteronomy chapter 7, Moses is restating the covenant with its blessings and its curses, Deuteronomy chapter 7, he mentions wine several times as a blessing. Deuteronomy 7 verse 13, he will love you and bless you and multiply you. He will also bless the fruit of your womb and the fruit of your ground, your grain and your new wine and your oil, the increase of your herd and the young of your flock and the land which he swore to your forefathers to give you. We have grain, wine, and oil. Those will show up again and again. At the end of the book, chapter 23, the final note, Moses' song. Toward the end of that song, verse 28. So Israel dwells in security, the fountain of Jacob secluded, in a land of grain and new wine. His heavens also drop down dew. It's been a long time since I've sung the song Beulah Land. Is it I've reached or I'll reach the land of corn and I've reached the land of corn and wine? For those using the King James Version, it has the word corn instead of grain. So that's where the songwriter got that. Here from Deuteronomy, blessing, grain, and wine. But then the opposite is true. Deuteronomy chapter 28. Contrast that with 
this lack of wine. You shall plant and cultivate vineyards, but you will neither drink of the wine nor gather the grapes, for the worm will devour them. Verse 51, moreover, the enemy nation shall eat the offspring of your herd and the produce of your ground until you are destroyed. Who also leaves you no grain, new wine, or oil, nor the increase of your herd, nor the young of your flock until they have caused you to perish. So then based on this wording from Deuteronomy, when we turn to the prophets, they communicate the threat of punishment or the joy of restoration through these symbols of grain and wine. And a great example of that is the book of Hosea. Hosea prophesied to the northern kingdom. They had turned to Baal, which was a Canaanite deity that was connected to agricultural fertility. So there are many passages in Hosea that picture judgment in agricultural terms, such as chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For she, speaking of God's people, does not know that it was I who gave her the grain, the new wine and the oil, and lavished on her silver and gold, which they used for Baal. Therefore, I will take back my grain at harvest time and my new wine in its season. I gave you these things, but you turned around and used them in your worship to Baal. So it's only right that I'm going to take them away. Hosea chapter 9, he pictured Israel as these grapes that he found and he planted, but they didn't bear fruit for him. They were bearing fruit for Baal, so they would be cast away. Having described their destruction with that metaphor, the final chapter beautifully describes the future restoration. Hosea chapter 14, verses 4 and 7. I will heal their apostasy. I will love them freely. Those who live in his shadow will again raise grain. They will blossom like the vine. His renown will be like the wine of Lebanon. These passages of restoration, we commonly link them to messianic promises. We know that some of them may have more to do with a physical restoration. Maybe they picture both, but we have that in our mind. This is looking ahead to God's action in the future. And so we notice that in this passage and many others, the blessing is pictured with wine. And this actually begins early in the Old Testament. If you go back to Genesis chapter 49, you remember when Jacob was stating the blessings to his 12 sons, and he gets to Judah, a passage well known to many of you, where he talks about the scepter is not going to depart from Judah, and so there we have the messianic promise. But then go to verses 11 and 12 as he talks about how Judah will experience this prosperity, this success. And it's described this way. He ties his foal to the vine and his donkey's colt to the choice vine. He washes his garments in wine and his robes in the blood of grapes. His eyes are dull from wine and his teeth white from milk. Wine and milk are symbols of the prosperity of Judah's future. In the centuries leading up to Christ, this passage was quoted frequently by the Jewish people as a messianic passage. They understood it that way as well. And so we go to Joel chapter 3. He describes the future of God's people. And that day the mountains will drip with sweet wine and the hills will flow with milk, wine and milk. Amos chapter 9 uses that same phrase, the mountains will drip with sweet wine to describe the days in which the messianic promise to David is fulfilled. And so many passages in the Old Testament use a good harvest to picture God's future blessings. About half of the prophets specifically use the metaphor of wine. In Isaiah chapter 25, this future time is pictured as a banquet provided by Yahweh. Isaiah chapter 25, verses 6 through 8. The Lord of hosts will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, and refined aged wine. So here you have this victory banquet. In the context of Isaiah 24 through 27, it's the Isaiah Apocalypse, it's, it's all about judgment. He's going to judge all the nations and his own people. And once he's defeated those who are oppressing his people and, and purged sin from among them, now it's this time of tremendous blessing, a banquet provided by the Lord. Now, if I said Isaiah 25 to you, you may not know what's in that passage. But you'll recognize the next sentence. 
On this mountain, he will swallow up the covering which is over all peoples, even the veil which is stretched over all nations, and he will swallow up death for all time. The Lord God will wipe away the tears from all faces. We know that from the book of Revelation. This great promise from God. That while we are feasting on the things that he has provided us, he has swallowed up death. We have plenty of evidence from inside the Bible. But it's always helpful when we see people from outside the Bible who have caught on to this particular strain of thought, this wine motif. And in fact, there are two books that are roughly contemporaneous with John's gospel where we have this concept of a supernatural abundance of wine connected with the coming of the Messiah. In 2 Baruch chapter 29, the author describes what will happen after a series of calamities on the earth. And the imagery comes from Isaiah chapter 27. Those who are living in the land, who are faithful, are protected from the judgment. And so now they get to experience this time of supernatural abundance, including the miraculous harvest of grapes and wine production. Verses 3 and 5 of 2 Baruch chapter 29 says, And it shall come to pass, when all is accomplished that was to come to pass in those parts, that the Messiah shall then begin to be revealed. The earth also shall yield its fruit 10,000 fold, and on each vine there shall be a thousand branches. Each branch shall produce a thousand clusters. Each cluster produce a thousand grapes, and each grape produce a core of wine. So with the revealing of the Messiah, the supernatural abundance, the harvest, but specifically grapes and wine is mentioned. Similarly, in, in 1 Enoch, there are several passages that refer to a great time of blessing following judgment. Uh, some of these, the motif is like the restoration of the Garden of Eden or a new creation. There's one brief reference that talks about people eating with a messianic figure. 1 Enoch 62, 14, and the Lord of spirits will abide over them, and with that Son of Man shall they eat and lie down and rise up forever and ever. And then in chapter 10, verses 18 and 19, there's a passage very similar to the passage in Baruch, where it talks about an abundant harvest. The desirable trees shall be planted on it. They shall plant vines on it. The vine which they plant shall yield wine in abundance. All the seed that is sown thereon, the measure of it shall be a thousand, and each measure of olive shall yield ten presses of oil. Did you notice that? Wine, grain, and oil drawing from the book of Deuteronomy, this concept of God and a covenant relationship with his people. And so once he has defeated the enemies and purged sin from within his own people, now they can experience a time of great blessing. And in some of these passages, it's specifically connected to the coming of the Messiah. Maybe because we have so much food in our culture. We tend to overlook the significance of these passages that talk about feasting and banqueting. And the fact that the kingdom is frequently pictured as a banquet. The miracle at Cana fits into this larger category of banqueting references. So we've noticed the specific metaphor of wine. But then, as Isaiah 25 introduced to us, there's wine in the context of this feast. I think I meant to mention this earlier. It's in the book. We're not going to go into um, the stories often talk about the idea of wine in the Bible and Christians in wine. So you've got to buy the book to see what I have to say about that. But for the sake of time, we're not going to talk about that this morning. So this fits into this larger category of parables told by Jesus to explain his kingdom. So just as John expected his first readers to know the Old Testament well, he expected them to know the sayings of Jesus. They would have memorized those, the, the parables that Jesus told, his basic teachings. And so then they see here is a wedding story. And it calls to mind the other wedding stories told by Jesus. And we should mention that this has its roots before the New Testament era. There's the idea of sacred marriage, 
In the Old Testament, God is married to his people. Israel is his bride. But there is a very significant aspect to this. Because Yahweh is the groom of Israel in the Old Testament, there is no evidence that the Jewish people spoke of the Messiah as the bridegroom of Israel. This is a Christian innovation that began with John the Baptist and was intentionally, purposely set forth by Jesus. And so when Jesus compares the kingdom to a wedding, he's using a metaphor that would have been very understandable to the Jewish people. The idea of rejoicing, this great moment in life, uh, particularly be connected to uh, procreation and the blessings that God would bring the nation. But he uses this metaphor familiar to the Jewish people, but he supplies it with surprising content. He either implies or directly refers to himself as the bridegroom. He intentionally wanted his disciples to view him as the groom of God's people and God's people as his bride. In a few places, we have just a very concise reference to the bridegroom. And in these, usually it's the emphasis is on joy. While the bridegroom is, is with you, you don't fast. John rejoices that he gets to be the best man. He gets to be close to the bridegroom. But in the wedding parables that Jesus tells, all of them have the element of judgment. There's a sudden reversal from joy and feasting to condemnation for some of the characters in the story. The rejection of the invitation, the refusal to wear the wedding garments, the failure to be ready for the groom's arrival, all of these bring judgment. And so it's possible that the observation that the wine had run out is a subtle reference to judgment. The barrenness of contemporary spiritual reality that only the true bridegroom could change. While it's impossible to prove that, I would have you note that the next story vividly brings judgment to our mind as Jesus clears the temple of materialistic worshipers from his father's house. The response to John, uh, of John to his disciples in John chapter 3, the next chapter, confirms this understanding of Jesus' miracle. John confesses Jesus to be the bridegroom. The master of the feast in Cana was speaking to a bridegroom, but he wasn't speaking to the bridegroom, Jesus of Nazareth, the one who provided the good wine. The significance of this metaphor was communicated to the apostle Paul. So at this wedding, you have a handful of the disciples who will become the apostles. And we know that the apostles were with Jesus from the very beginning. That was one of the qualifications. But then Paul comes along later. So he certainly wasn't at this event. And yet we turn to Paul's writings. And his greatest passage on marriage, Ephesians chapter 5, he compares the husband and wife relationship to Christ and the church. The church is the bridegroom of Christ. To the Corinthians, in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, he compares their conversion to, I've betrothed you to Christ. And now it's my responsibility or my concern to make sure you maintain that purity for the wedding day. And so in that passage, it maybe is more obvious, but in Ephesians chapter 5 as well, we have engagement somewhat different than betrothal, but both seem to reflect that idea that Christ's return is the wedding day. We have the marriage metaphor. And of course, the final piece of evidence of the significance of this action of Jesus is from the same author. In the final pages of the Bible, we find this motif referenced again. Revelation chapter 19, verses 7 through 9. 
The victorious saints are pictured as the bride ready for her husband, who is the Lamb of God, who was slain. Revelation 19, verse 7, beginning. Let us rejoice and be glad and give the glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. It was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen, bright and clean, for the fine linen is the righteous acts of the saints. Then he said to me, Right, blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are true words of God. It's no accident that Jesus' first sign was turning water to wine at a wedding. This is the first miracle because it points to Jesus as the true bridegroom of God's people and the one who will inaugurate the messianic era with all its blessings. And that's a time of rejoicing for the people of God. Even as the passage in Revelation says, let us rejoice and be glad. And yet in proximity to that, we have John the Baptist proclaiming Jesus to be the Lamb of God. And Jesus' statement, my hour has not yet come. And in Revelation, the groom is the Lamb of God who was slain. And so we understand that these tremendous blessings can only come through the sacrifice, the death of Jesus Christ our Lord. On the cross. And so that touches us. It grieves us. And yet as Jesus wanted to communicate, ultimately, it's something to rejoice about. We are the bride of Christ. We've been invited to the feast. That is a wedding I do not want to miss. Thank you for your kind attention this morning.